Thank you very much, Philip. Yeah, um, thank you very much for the invitation as well. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I'd like to just give a very broad overview of how network science has been used in uh, Roman studies. And I tried to make the argument that uh, the easy cases, the easy examples are kind of all done already. Now what's left for us, you know, Roman scholars doing network science are the really hard ones. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. Um, and that's very normal. Like if, if a new approach is introduced in a discipline, very quickly the proponents of that approach will just show, you know, those obvious examples, the theoretically easiest ways of uh, saying that this is a really cool toy and we need to do way more of that. And they disappear very quickly and then the followers are kind of like left scratching their heads saying like, so what do we do now? Are there other things we can, uh, we can, uh, we can do with this new toy? Um, but uh, it's going to be an optimistic argument because I think doing the hard work is actually going to be worth our while. Not only will it lead to new insights about uh, past Roman society, but also they will be the kind of insights that we could have only gained through using network science. We couldn't have gotten these insights in any other way. It's, it's a pretty big argument, actually. I hope it'll be convincing uh, when, once I make it. But first, I'll give a little bit of an, uh, of an overview of how we've been doing network science. Network science, I mean, I'm, I'm just talking about, you know, people using points and lines to do archaeology and uh, study those points and lines. Uh, by far, the most common application is for the study of uh, road networks, transport systems uh, in urban contexts or in regional contexts. Here's an, uh, an example by Leif Isaacson, uh, where he represents... Uh, the Antonine itineraries, as well as uh, the major rivers, uh, the Vicarello goblets and uh, the Ravenna cosmography, all sources that reveal some ways in which uh, people, goods and ideas could have flowed between uh, places, but like the physical routes that they might have uh, taken between the towns. And he represents them like a network and he studies that network. Uh, another example has already been mentioned, the uh, Orbis uh, toy. It is absolutely fantastic. You know, it's, it's the Google, Google Maps of, uh, of the ancient world. Uh, it represents mainly the uh, towns, the major towns and uh, roads that are represented in the Barrington Atlas. And then you can, you know, ask like, I'm at Schiphol Airport, how do I get to Rome, for example, um, using only ox cart, these kind of very important questions. <laughs> uh, no, but it's, it's, a, it's a really great tool though. Uh, Another group of applications are the study, the use of uh, space syntax, especially access analysis within urban context, but that's just been mentioned, so I'm not going into detail there. A second body of applications, uh, mainly in archaeology, consider considers the study of similarity networks. Uh, it's something that archaeologists like to do a lot. We like to look at our site assemblages, the stuff that we excavate at sites, and see whether stuff we find at one site is very similar to the stuff we find at another site. So for example, we have two sites, site one and site two. At site one, we excavate pot type one and pot type two, and at site two, we only excavate pot type two. Now we can make a network out of that by representing the sites as nodes, by representing the pot types as nodes, and drawing lines if stuff is found somewhere. And that creates a similarity. You know, if pot type two is present at both site one and site two, there's some sort of similarity there. You can use loads of different metrics to represent this kind of uh, similarity, uh, if you really want. And you can really play around with that. You can do loads of stuff with that. There's so many networks you can make if you just have the data. Um, we could, this is just, I'm just representing this as a kind of work we did with uh, Simon Kay and Graham Earl on, uh, on uh, um, networks, uh, urban networks in Rome and Southern Spain. And what we tried to think of is, all of the ways in which we could make networks, because we had this network toy and we just wanted to use it on this massive uh, digitized data set that we had about Roman Southern Spain. So we had ceramics, architecture, coins, roads, uh, um, uh, foreigners uh, that are attested as being in different places, inscriptions, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we try to explore it in a very broad chronological scale. So on the other axis, we consider time. You know, we go from Iberian times to Republican, early imperial, middle imperial. We just chop things up very conveniently. And then we uh, consider a third axis, which is space. And if you consider these three, you can make uh, different types of networks. If we just look at the assemblage of individual sites, then we can make little stars where you have the site at the center and the stuff that's found at sites um, connected to it. 
if we consider multiple sites within one region, for example, one Roman province uh, or, or, or smaller, like Conventus, then we get these uh, kind of similarity networks that I showed earlier. And then you can do that for all the stuff you have, basically. In our case, that was for the Roman province of Baetica. And then you get nicely complicated looking archaeological uh, networks. Does that mean anything? I'll address that later. Uh, but archaeologists like doing that. It's a different way of exploring your data. It forces you to think about relationships. It's sometimes very useful, not always. Uh, another thing we like to do is theory, theory modeling. So if we have a theory about how relationships affected some sort of phenomena that we have, uh, that we are interested in, like uh, the, the spread of a religion, for example, that's what Anna Collar studies in this particular book, then we might consider using network science to represent our ideas about uh, that particular phenomenon. So what Anna does is she argues that um, proximity of major urban centers in the Roman Empire uh, was a key factor for the diffusion of new religions throughout the empire. Uh, in a particular way, uh, the closer places are together, uh, the more they could be exposed to this new influence. Uh, so she uses something called proximal point analysis. It's a, a three nearest neighborhood uh, analysis where you just draw lines to the three closest points to uh, every point and then you get a beautiful network and you can explore your ideas about the spread of, um, of a religion over that network. And obviously that always goes hand in hand with arguments why that's a useful thing to do, why that's particularly appropriate to make this kind of network. And another big body of applications is a study of uh, social networks. Particularly interesting is this one, a uh, study by Sean Graham. It's enormously creative because what he does here is um, he studies Roman bricks in himself, not particularly interesting, but on those Roman bricks, uh, the people who made them were kind enough to put a stamp. On the stamp, it says, um, you know, which uh, place it was made at. He could, for certain cases, this is a study in the Tiber Valley, he could identify the brick making uh, facilities. He could, in some cases, through documentation, identify who owned the plot of land from which the clay might have been uh, gained, where the uh, brick-making uh, facilities were actually based. And then he could uh, also try to get the chemical signature to better pinpoint the places where the clay uh, was uh, being uh, uh, collected and who owned those plots of land. That just leads to uh, a lot of different names. You know, people who were involved at different stages of the brick uh, creation and also leasing different plots of land. He could create a social network out of that. And it sounds very mundane, a social network of Roman bricks, of clay, uh, but that's basically what archaeologists do. The results were really surprising. Um, he could identify people at loads of different kind of social uh, strata, going all the way up to the sister of a, of a Roman empire. So this is really cool. You've got, you know, a guy putting a stamp on a, on a brick, as well as the sister of, um, of a Roman em emperor. In some way, they were connected by doing this kind of analysis. And this is um, a social network of Cicero's letters. Here, we basically take Cicero's letters, fantastic data set. He talks to, well, he wrote, wrote to a lot of people. Those people are explicitly named. And we draw a line when Cicero sends a letter to someone, when he mentions someone in that letter that he knows, when he gets a letter from someone else. And then we can write, uh, then we can make a beautiful network like this with Cicero at the center. Now. I'd like to uh, play the devil's advocate and go into this study in a little bit more detail. Why on earth is that interesting? Why do we want to look at Cicero's letters as a network? And the authors give an explanation at the very start, and you're not going to like this. But basically they say, so it's uh, Alexander and Anofsky, Ancient historians generally understand that confidence in our reconstruction of Roman social structure must be limited by the recognition that we rely at least in part on biased statements about it by the Romans themselves. Fair enough, I agree. Communication research offers a method of analyzing interactions between individuals on a quantitative and comprehensive basis, which allows us to achieve a more reliable picture of the Roman social structure. Whoa. So he says that communication research um, is better at doing ancient history than ancient history. 
And I, th I think that's a bit of a stretch. And I think actually this, these are the first two sentences of the paper. I think this is kind of like a, a reason why this very old application of network science applied to Roman studies has never really been cited by any ancient historian because they read the first two sentences and then thought like, okay, well, well screw you. <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll play the devil's advocate and use this as a, as a good example. Why could we possibly be interested in uh, networks such as this? Um, is it just, are we just doing this kind of stuff? Are we drawing networks because we can? Because we have the toy called network science. Because we have these fantastic data sets in Roman studies. We have a guy called Cicero writing letters to different people, and we can make a network out of that. It's, it's a social network, right? Surely that's interesting. Surely that's, you know, a reason on its own to do this kind of stuff. Um, from my tone, you'll gather that I disagree with that. Um, and we can ask ourselves, why should we care then about network science? What are the cases within which we can make a strong argument for saying network science is not s just something that we can do here, but network science is something that we have to do in this case? Because within my research context, with the kind of phenomenon I'm trying to understand, there's no other tool that enables me to answer my questions. Okay, here comes the actual argument, and I'm hoping it's going to be convincing because I'm kind of building up the, uh, the claims here. Let's first define network science. So network science is the management, representation, and analysis of network data, so points and lines, for the study of relational phenomena. I didn't just make that up. This is a definition by Ulrich Brandes and colleagues in the first issue of the appropriately named journal called Network Science, and so they had to define uh, this particular discipline. You'll notice that it's uh, a very formal definition. It, can, it, it, it considers uh, a very formal uh, body of techniques that enables you to deal with uh, network data in order to study relational phenomena. What this is not is a definition of network science applied to Roman studies or network science applied to social networks or applied to anything. This is just network science. Network science allows you to play with points and lines. But what we want to do is good archaeology, is good history, is trying to understand past phenomena. And with network science, we don't study those past phenomena directly. Uh, instead, we try to find appropriate abstractions uh, to study those past phenomena. So the past phenomena are things like, you know, how people moved around in the Roman Empire, a, R a Roman transport system, if you want to call it something like that. It's not a Roman uh, transport network. A Roman transport network didn't exist. A network didn't exist in the past. They're not real things. They're just a name that we use to try to abstract a very complex past reality we're trying to understand. I talk about the past Roman transport network because you know, like, oh yeah, he's referring to the Antonine itineraries, places and roads between them. Um, but there is a, you know, there's no, uh, uh, I'm not trying to say that I'm, addressing the full complexity of that past phenomena. I'm also not saying that the network is the most appropriate abstraction to address every aspect of that past phenomena in its full complexity. It's just good for saying something about the points and the lines and why they matter. So as archaeologists and historians, what we need to do is to come up with good arguments why an abstraction of past phenomena into certain network concepts is an appropriate abstraction. And that argument should address the question um, whether network science is the only way that allows us to answer our uh, research questions. It's an appropriate abstraction because with network science we can do things that we couldn't do in any other way. Then what network science allows us to do is to uh, represent these kind of concepts as network data, as points and lines. Again, we have to make arguments why certain network patterns are particularly appropriate representations of network concepts, but network science helps us in this. You know, if you're interested in how important particular towns were as intermediaries for the flow of information and people in a transport network, then network science suggests that between the centrality is something you might want to look into. This is a network data representation of a concept of intermediateness. So doing good network science is doing good archaeology and history in applied contexts. We need to make credible arguments from our position as data specialists, as you know, ha knowing what the relevant questions are to ask within our uh, research context, knowing what the data allows us to say, what the data doesn't allow us to say. Good network science is good archaeology or history. There's 
a huge diversity of past relational phenomena that have been explored already with network science in Roman studies. But what all of these have in common is that they do formulate these kind of arguments and that they do uh, consider theories about why relationships matter. So they don't just study relationships for the sake of it. They argue that those relationships are fundamental for understanding the past phenomena uh, they're interested in understanding. Those are archaeological and historical theories. And again, to go from those theories to you know, data that you use as evidence for whether those theories are right or wrong is not network science. That again is archaeology and history. That again is you saying that with this data, I can actually talk about these theories. So don't use network science as an excuse that you can say certain things uh, if the archaeological or historical data doesn't allow you to say those things. That's just bad archaeology and bad network science. It's going to be, become more optimistic. Uh, <laughs> we can actually do certain things with network science. Um, I'll give a couple of examples. I'll give a couple of examples of those kinds of archaeological and historical theories that you can explore. Consider this here. Uh, let's call it a, a road network. Uh, two phases. We have phase A and phase B. On the left-hand side, we've got three towns, and they're connected by roads. Uh, we assume that the roads could be used for transporting people, goods, uh, maybe even ideas along with those people, from town A to town C. But you'd always have to pass through, through town B. Now, being in that particular position on the road network gives town B an opportunity that the other towns don't have. The community there might decide to uh, levy a sort of tax on all the goods that pass through it. Or they might, at certain uh, moments, block transport, for example. In this case, this is a relational theory because the relationships matter in a very specific way. This particular pattern of relationships, those two roads, affect the properties of one of the towns. It affects the properties of all of the towns, but of one of the towns in a very particular way. Town B is more central in this particular way because the roads, the road pattern as it is now, affects their opportunity to increase their tax revenue, to control the flow of resources, to control the flow of people. That's one example of how uh, um, um, networks might matter, how relationships might matter. However, at some point, those people in town A and town C could say like, well, that's not very nice. Uh, you know, we're so bored of always having to travel through town B. It's a really long road. Also, those guys at town B, they're not very nice to us. They always ask for money. Let's build a road. So the network changes in the second phase. We have a direct road between town A and town C. Uh, that gives the towns the ability to bypass the taxes levied in town B. Now, here we have a different type of theory about how relationships matter. Here we have a way in which one relationship is dependent on other relationships. The relationship between town A and town C came to be as an effect of the previous state. Because you had relationships between town A and B and B and C in a first state, those two relationships gave rise to the creation of the relationship between town A and town C. So if we have archaeological or historical theories about how relationships matter because they give rise to the creation or destruction of other relationships, then we have to do network science. I didn't uh, come up with this myself. This is all published in, uh, along with that definition of network science. But if we think about Orbis in this way, if we think about Roman road networks in light of our theories why uh, the position of towns matter, why the uh, structure of roads matter, then you know, we have a very good argument for trying to ask these kind of questions. How do I get to Rome using ox carts? You know? like, I'm particularly interested in how central Rome is, how it was able to control the flow of resources, or how important another town was in control of the, source, uh, the flow of resources. Those are the kind of theories you need to formulate in order to uh, make Orbis worth your while. Or you could just play around with it, which is fun, but it's not uh, a good argument for why you should do network science. Let's look at this uh, second example, uh, which is you know, the thing archaeologists do, similarity networks. Very often, like in the example I just showed, you know, with this cube in the three dimensions where me, Simon Kay, and Graham Merle did a lot of, you know, archaeological networks, that was, if, if I have to be brutally honest, we did that because we could. Um, and very often, that's what we do. You know, we represent our data in different ways in order to be confronted with the structure of the data and trying to 
figure out aspects, little patterns in the data that we haven't seen before. But that in itself is not a reason why we should use network science. Instead, we could try to think about how uh, we, ha we formulate theories about these relationships and similarity networks. So here we have relationships between sites and uh, the, the assemblages, the stuff that's found on them. We could assume that the similarity between sites matters because over time it increases the probability that those assemblages will become even more similar that those, uh, the communities at those towns have uh, stronger contacts than with towns that they don't have particularly similar assemblages with, and that the uh, exchange of goods, of people and ideas increase through time, so that through time your assemblage becomes more similar. If you formulate a theory like that, which as archaeologists we very, very, very often do, uh, you're basically doing something like this. In one phase you have a certain structure of the network, and the existence of these three relationships affect the existence of this relationship. If you formulate a theory that similarity between site assemblages matters because it increases the probability of future similarities, then that's what you're trying to do. These are the kind of theories that network science allows you to explore. If I would have formulated these kind of theories before, you know, making this figure, I wouldn't have had to make this cube. I would be able to identify exactly where on the three axes I could do network science so that it would answer a very specific question in light of my archaeological theories. So, you know, why should we do networks of Cicero? Uh, you know, the data is there, it's absolutely fantastic, it's really cool to explore it as a network, but we have to formulate theories about why the relationships between people in the past actually mattered in very, very, very specific ways. Is uh, if Cicero and Atticus were friends, and Atticus had another friend that Cicero was not a friend with, then maybe there's a higher probability that Cicero would become friends with that other person in the future. That's the kind of theory that we can explore with network science. Without these theories, this is fun, but you could probably come to the same conclusions in uh, a different way, using different tools. So, the potential of network science, I would argue, for the study of uh, the Roman past is it offers us a way of formally exploring, studying, representing, and comparing with archaeological and historical data our theories about why relationships matter for trying to understand past uh, phenomena. It's not just a hammer that we have and you know, everything becomes a nail when we have this hammer and we're just kind of like hitting stuff all over the place. Um, that's fine. There's no problem with that at all. But probably it's not the best way to explore uh, whether you should do network science in the first place. Now, so there's loads of potential, I think, you know, if we think through our archaeological theories, but there's also a lot of challenges uh, that you're confronted with as soon as you say, like, you know what, within my research context, relationships are actually important in this very particular way. When you then try to get to grips with network science and do it yourself, there is a bunch of methodological issues, a bunch of uh, you know, processual issues, data-related and spatial uh, analytical scales uh, issues that you might be confronted with. Uh, on the one hand, we can never forget that network science offers us a bunch of techniques that are developed by statisticians and mathematicians, physicists, uh, very often to be applied in different disciplines to address a very specific uh, research question, to be applied to very particular kind of data. These are not the kind of techniques that we can just adopt without asking any questions, without opening up the black box and seeing exactly what's inside. We need to get to grips with what between a centrality means, what it actually calculates, what those calculations mean in light of my archaeological theory about relationships, and then reconsider whether between a centrality is actually the most appropriate technique uh, for the job. Very many of these... Um, concepts also have very particular network data patterns associated with it. Uh, you might have heard of this concept called a small world, for example. It's this idea that, um, you know, everyone in the world can be connected to everyone else in relatively few steps. There's a model proposed for that, uh, a network science model that tries to capture that particular properties of social networks. It considers uh, that communities tend to be clustered, they tend to have a lot of connections within the community, but very few connections between the communities, but still enabling information to flow throughout the entire network and reaching everyone. Now, 
This is a very particular network data pattern, but it's also a very tempting concept. You might say like, oh, it's a very small world, you know, the Greeks were a very small world, the Romans were a very small world, small worlds everywhere. It's absolutely fantastic. That's not particularly useful because you are referring to something that has a very specific network data pattern. And if you cannot illustrate that, you know, that network data pattern is in any way reflected in your data, or you have very strong arguments why that network data pattern is a good representation of your theory, then uh, you should not use that term. Then there's processual issues. So very often, and th these are kind of issues that you're just de dealing with as archaeologists, really. You know, we're exploring our archaeological assemblages, we're exploring our historical sources, uh, and they're kind of like static representations of what happened at some point in the past. Uh, we try to understand a dynamic past um, phenomenon. Can we do that by just representing our data as networks? Um, are there ways in which uh, maybe computational modeling might offer a way forward? In which cases, yes. In which cases, no. Um, these are questions you'll have to ask yourself. A lot of network science also tends to be aspatial. Not in archaeology, because we love space. We love space because it's basically everything we have. We have stuff in space. But sociologists have so much more. And they used uh, social network analysis before us. Uh, so they kind of neglected the development of spatial techniques. Uh, so a lot of the questions that we ask in archaeology have this kind of spatial component, and we might not find the most appropriate network science technique to actually translate the, those archaeological questions into uh, a workable network science technique. Maybe in some cases we need to develop new uh, network science techniques that address archaeological questions. Then um, there's also the problem that you might have noticed this from my definition of network science. It's very specific. The theories you can address, you have to formulate them very specifically. You have to be able to say that nodes are bounded entities and that they are representations of very specific things. If you are unable in your research context for theoretical reasons to say that these kind of categories existed um, and are meaningful, if the categories themselves are fluid entities, um, for example, you are reluctant to say, you know, I'm talking about uh, this type of amphorae and this type of Roman tableware, for example. If that is not possible, you're saying, you know, this type of amphora is not considered an entity in the past, so it's not appropriate to represent it as such, then network science is not what you can do, if that's a deal breaker. Okay, so these arguments of what the potential is of network science, formal network science, uh, through this definition of network science is published in this special issue of Journal of Archaeological Method and Theory, as well as in this uh, book we recently published. Also, that book uh, lists uh, a discussion of all those challenges I mentioned on the previous slide. So if you really want to uh, you know, explore all of the problems you might be confronted with, then uh, have a look at that. Um, I think I'm going to drop my example. Um, Maybe, maybe, maybe very quickly, uh, I try to do this in practice. I try to uh, think about what my uh, data sets that I'm trying to understand, the archaeological data sets, what kind of research questions I can answer with it, and why relationships matter for those research questions. I'm particularly interested in how information flowed around in the Roman Empire, how that influenced the prices at different markets, and the ability of individual traders to be informed about those prices at different markets. Uh, different scholars have proposed different theories for how information might flow around in a Roman market economy. And uh, they have also proposed certain archaeological proxy evidence of uh, their theories. So what you can do with network science is represent these theories and see whether they actually match up under what conditions with archaeological data. We tried to do that in a paper uh, published in Antiquity last year. The model itself, it's, a, it's an... Uh, an agent-based uh, network model is uh, published in Journal of Artificial Societies and Social Simulation, and the model is freely available on OpenABM. Um, so that is my <laughs> example to just seal the deal that network science has great potential. Uh, so, so to conclude, uh, network science has great potential for the study of uh, the Roman past, but uh, sadly, all the easy applications that are 
really, really useful have probably already you know, been done. What remains are the really hard ones, but they will be very rewarding. We'll have to be confronted with loads of challenges, uh, but eventually we'll be able to answer questions that you could only answer using network science. If you uh, consider these kind of questions, right? If you think about, do relationships actually matter for my archeological or historical theories? Um, can my archaeological or historical data allow me to answer those uh, kind of questions? Uh, just be very critical. Do good archaeology and you'll do good network science. Thank you.